uh, did a little traveling at the beginning of this week, and you have a lot of conversations with folks. Someone approached me. We were talking about where certain ideas in the church came from, where the term the Great Commission came from, and then and then someone asked, where did the term sinner's prayer, where did the sinner's prayer, you know what I'm talking about, the sinner's prayer, I've sinned, I've done wrong, I invite you into my heart, Jesus, I invite you into my heart, come uh, enter my heart, be both Lord and Savior, something along those lines. There's variations, but they all kind of follow the same two-step pattern. Where did that come from, it was asked, and I said, I don't know. I don't know because it's not found in the Bible. Even the ideas behind it aren't found in the Bible. Or maybe they are. Was I wrong? Look at Romans chapter 10. That's St. Paul. He says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified. With the mouth one confesses and is saved. Sounds practically like the sinner's prayer. Joining us for our ongoing series on responding to evangelical proof texts on this Friday afternoon, October the 17th, we'll deal with Romans chapter 10, those two verses. Pastor Brian Wolf Miller, he's pastor of Hope Lutheran Church in Aurora, Colorado, co-host of a weekly radio talk show called Table Talk Radio. Brian, welcome back to Issues Etc. Thank you. It's practically the sinner's prayer. reads almost like it, uh, and I imagine that uh, many, an evangelical, will say, look, that's where we get this idea of inviting Jesus into our heart. It's an easy two-step means to salvation. How do you respond? Yeah, this is one of the, I mean, this is one of the great reasons for calling this series that we're doing evangelical proof texting, is because that's one of the, the marks of this kind of reading the Bible, is you totally strip it out from all of the context. There's, there's so much in Romans chapter 10 that is so wonderful and so beautiful and so illustrative to the things that Paul is talking about in this verse that to take it out of context, you might be able to twist it and make it sound like, yeah, this is up to you. If you believe, it's your own action. If you confess, that's your own doing. But Paul, in other places, in fact, he'll, he'll say to the Corinthians, no one can say Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. And then just a few verses down from this one, he'll say that faith itself comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of God. So that our believing and our confessing is not up to us. In fact, if it were up to us, all we could do would be to confess ourselves and our idolatry and our sin. Uh, If it were up to us, all we could believe in would be ourselves and the devil and everything else wicked. Uh, But Jesus is the one who gives us the gift of believing in him. He works faith in us, and he gives us the gift of confessing his name. Now, if we understand that, that the faith is the work of God, and that confession is the work of God, a gift from him, then this text comes to us in a fantastically new and different and beautiful way, that this is not up to us. This is the work of the Lord himself. So rather than, as evangelicals will do with this passage, they'll use this passage to, in essence, trump everything else that the Bible clearly teaches about not only salvation being a free gift, but even faith being a free gift that... uh, through which God bestows salvation. Yeah, that's, uh, we that's, ought to really let those clear teachings of Scripture illuminate how we're reading this passage in Romans chapter 9. That's exactly right. That's what that, that uh, Ephesians 2 text is so beautiful, where you, by grace you're saved through faith, and that, that faith, that is not of yourself. That's a gift of God. But even our faith, even our believing is, is a gift from God. And we, and we have to know this. I mean, this is one of the key problems with evangelical teaching is that everything goes back to the will, the choice that we make, the decision, uh, and that it is basically the will that converts us. The spirit and the will uh, is what makes us converted, whereas the Bible understands that it is precisely that our will is the object of conversion. When the Lord comes to us in his word, he is changing our will so that the unbelieving heart is a believing heart. The, The heart that hates the Lord now loves the Lord. The heart that is an enemy of God is now washed and cleaned and becomes free. So that rather than our will being the thing that converts us, our will is part of the very thing that the Lord converts. So let's delve into the passage itself. Now, you said context is very important. So how would you describe the context of Paul's famous words here about 
um, confessing with the mouth, believing with the heart, believing with the heart, and confessing with the mouth. Where do they fit in in the broader scope of the 10th chapter of Romans and of Paul's theology? Yeah, well, the, so probably Romans chapter 1 to 8 is, is his most systematic development of doctrine. Uh, and then he in chapter 9, Paul takes up the, the problem of Israel. How is it that Israel, God's people, is now basically cast off into unbelief? And he'll use himself, especially in chapter 11, as an example of God's mercy to Israel, saying, look at me, I'm, this is what the Lord does to save Israel. He baptizes them and, and makes them into Christians. But now in chapter 10, he's talking about how the, this message of salvation, the word of salvation, is going out not just to the Jew, but in fact to the entire world. And the result of that, you know, Paul was always beleaguered with the uh, Judaizers, the people that were coming behind him saying, well, Paul was fine on talking about God's grace, but he was too loose on the law. So you have to do more to be saved. You have to be circumcised and be Jewish first and all this sort of nonsense. And Paul's combating that with especially chapter 10, verse 4, with one of the most stunning and amazing texts in the Scripture. It says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And that, those words, I mean, this is amazing. These are favorite words of Luther and always favorite words of the Lutheran Church. They're words that made almost every other confession nervous. <laughs> because how is it that Jesus is the end of the law for righteousness? I mean, isn't that the purpose that the law was given, so that we would follow it and be righteous? But the Gospel says, no, no, no longer. Your righteousness comes from outside of you, from Christ. And then he says, he talks about Moses. Moses said that the person who, who lives by the law will, uh, has to keep all of them. And then he, he, Paul has this great dichotomy of where do you get that word of righteousness? How, how does it come to you? And he, he's quoting the Old Testament, and he says, Don't say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead, but what does it say? The word is near to you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. So Paul is teaching the church in Rome and us that the, the righteousness which Christ won for us in his death on the cross comes to us in the preaching of the word and no other way. This, this is beautiful. And, and there's, in fact, a lot here in this text where Paul says when the preaching of the word isn't there, then there's two types of false religion that will come in. So um, he's focusing really on the fact that um, salvation comes in from the outside. It doesn't require any kind of little hook in us to grab hold of in order to save us. It comes in and does—it the, 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 is the purely the word of the preaching of Christ that affects salvation in the unbeliever. That's right. The Lutherans called this the external word, externum verbum. That's the phrase for it. It's beautiful stuff. And, and that is that not only is God's word true, I mean, this, this is an amazing sort of thing to me that when we talk to evangelicals, uh, well, and when we talk to each other for that matter, we, we, we agree with them that, God's, that the Scripture is God's word and that it's true, that it's inerrant, that it's infallible, that it's inspired. We even say that it's clear, that it's sufficient. You need nothing else. That's a big one. But then we also say that it's efficacious. And in fact, the, the evangelical church does not have this doctrine of the Scriptures. They, we go farther than them when it comes to understanding the Bible, because when we say that God's Word is efficacious, what we're saying is that it, precisely in the promise of the Gospel, the preaching of God's Word, the delivery of the Word to us, the Holy Spirit works to convert and save and deliver and give all of His gifts that that happens in the Word. It's not like the Word is just information, and now I have to respond to it. You, 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 you give me the information, and now I make a decision, or I ac exercise my will, or I accept it, or whatever. No, that God's Word itself is powerful, and that it works. It does, uh, it does the same thing. It gives the same thing that it promises. Okay, take us into the, a few of the words, even some of the grammar here. Of of this famous two you know, couplet of verses here in Romans chapter ten, beginning with this notion of confessing with your mouth. What is this word to confess? Yeah, the Greek word is a beautiful one. It's homo logeo. So homo meaning the same, uh, and logeo meaning word or statement or reason or order, uh, something like this. Now, so to confess, it it means to, basically to echo, to, to speak 
the same thing, to say what you've heard. And this is so important, is that we cannot confess Christ unless we first hear Christ. And this is going to be the entire argument that Paul's going to make from here. Now, there's a number of different ways we think about confessing. Probably the first one is, uh, is we confess our sins, right? Uh, so that when we do something wrong, uh, we, we fess up. We speak it out. We say what we've done wrong. And what we're really doing when we confess our sins is we are saying of ourselves the same thing that God says of us already. In other words, the Lord comes to us and he says, Hey, uh, Todd, you're a sinner. Uh, here's the Ten Commandments, which you have not kept. And you say, Lord, you're right. I'm a sinner. So that's the confession of sins, is really to say the same thing about ourselves that the Lord has said. But then we can say more, because not only does the Lord tell us about ourselves and our sin, he tells us about himself and his son and his sacrifice and his cross. So now we turn it around and we confess our faith. That yes, I know I'm a sinner, but I also know that Christ died for me. So we talk about the confessions of the church. This is basically the church saying back to the Lord the same thing that he has already told us about himself. Hey, I created the world, and we say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And then he tells us, I'm, I'm incarnate, uh, I, I'm in the flesh, I'm born of a virgin, I'm, I'm dead on the cross, I'm raised, and we say, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. And then he tells us about the work of the Holy Spirit and how he, he sees to the ch- growth of the church in the world, and we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, forgiveness of sins, and so forth. So when we confess our faith, we're saying back to the Lord the same thing that he's already said to us. The other question, particular kind of grammatical question I had on those two verses was, it says, you know, uh, confess with the mouth and believe with the heart, then it turns it around, believe with the heart and confess with the mouth. Um, are these two different things, to believe and to confess? No, uh, I mean, I suppose, but there's a separation without a distinction, because remember Jesus says, out of the fullness of the heart a man speaks, so that you cannot, um, uh, you cannot confess Christ if you do not believe in Christ. This is why Paul will say, no one can say Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. Now, I suppose someone can say Jesus is Lord. He could, they can make those sounds. I mean, you could probably teach a parrot to say Jesus is Lord, but that's not confessing Christ as Lord. That's just, you know, making those sounds with your mouth. Uh, but this confession is, in fact, the, the, it, it is the fruit uh, on the lips of the tree that's planted in the heart. So the Lord gives us a new heart that believes in Christ, and now we can't but speak. So he's not giving us a two-step, kind of a mechanistic two-step uh, path to God. The two steps being, first, believe by force of your own will, as the evangelicals would assert, uh, maybe with a little help from God in there, who knows. And then, you're not quite there, you're almost there, you're halfway there, then you confess. Then, at the, after those two steps have been accomplished, you've come all the way to Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, of course. I mean, this whole idea of looking for kind of a, a mechanistic formula of conversion is just foreign to the Scriptures to begin with. I mean, the idea that, okay, now I, I want to be saved, but I'm not quite sure, so, so I want Jesus to give me a, a three-step or two-step, uh, I mean, just a checklist, and I can check these things off and do these sorts of things. No, this is not, this is not how the Scriptures ever talk. So that now, we, if we, so what Paul is saying, and he's, and he's writing all of these things to comfort us. I mean, remember, here's all these Gentiles that are in Rome, and they're Christians. They believe in Jesus. And now they're coming and being assaulted by this doctrine that they haven't done enough. You haven't been circumcised. You're not keeping the Sabbath law. You, you are in risk of not being saved because you haven't kept all the law. And Paul says, look, Christ is the end of the law for those who believe. If you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and confess uh, it with your lips... Uh, that he raised from, he's raised from the dead, then you will be saved. He's saying you don't need all of these other requirements that men are trying to put on you. You are Christians. You're, you're free. You're forgiven. You belong to the Lord. You're His. And you don't need all of these other uh, requirements and, and regulations. That Paul is setting the, the, the people of the church free. He's loosing them and unbinding them with these words. He's, he, he's not saying, hey, here's the things you've got to do if you want to get there. He's saying, you, you believe. You confess Christ. You belong to Him. Pastor Brian Wolfmiller is our guest on this Friday afternoon, October the 17th. We are responding to an evangelical proof text, Romans chapter 10. 
verses 9 and 10. When we come back, we'll talk a little bit about verse 11, because when he wants to summarize it, he just talks about believing. I'm Todd Wilkin. This is Issues Etc. Stay tuned. If any former evangelicals are hearing me speak right now, I want to assure you, you don't have to be a homeless Christian. If you would go to issuesetc.org, look on their website, you'll find a list of churches. Find one close to you and attend that church. There, you can receive the true gospel. You don't have to be a homeless Christian, and they will not call you a backslider. To find a church near you, go to issuesetc.org and click Find a Church. The 500th anniversary of the Lutheran Reformation is fast approaching. We have such a rich history as Lutherans, and many people don't realize that. The CLCC offers a seminar called Your Reformation Walk that teaches that rich heritage and helps you appreciate it. The CLCC also offers other seminars designed to help laity learn to appreciate what Lutherans believe, teach, and confess. So invite us to your church. Visit the CLCC.org and get details on scheduling a seminar for your church today. Listen to what you want, when you want. You're listening to Issues Etc. The Issues Etc. Book of the Month for October is a novel titled House of Living Stones. It's written by regular guest Katie Schuerman. House of Living Stones tells a story about the power of forgiveness in the life of a small Lutheran congregation. House of Living Stones costs ten ninety nine plus shipping and handling. For more information, call Concordia Publishing House, 1-800-325-3040, or you can browse before you buy at issuesetc.org. House of Living Stones. Welcome back to Issues Etc. I'm Todd Wilkin. We're responding to evangelical proof texts today. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. Pastor Brian Wolf Miller is our guest, pastor of Hope Lutheran Church in Aurora, Colorado, and co-host of a weekly radio talk show called Table Talk Radio. You'll find out more about it at our website, issuesetc.org. Click Listen on Demand. Brian, you wanted to back up a little bit uh, to the previous verses that you had mentioned in passing before and uh, focus our attention upon Paul's argument that involves uh, ascending up to be with Jesus or him coming down to be with us. Talk about that, if you would, and how does it elucidate the the better reading of this passage? Yeah, this is one of the marks of uh, American Christianity, is they, they just don't have the sacraments. They uh, they don't have baptism, they don't have the Lord's Supper. I mean, they baptize, but remember, it's an act of your will. They have the Lord's Supper, but it's a symbolic meal of remembrance. It's not the Lord delivering His promises to us. And, and this grows out of a the fact that the evangelical church does not have the efficacy of the Scripture, that the Holy Spirit is working in the Word. And and we understand that that, that promise of the external Word, that the Word is near to you, it, that Christ is near to you in the Word that is preached, that we, like Paul says, that that is our comfort. But if you don't have that, if you don't have the doctrine that Christ is near to you in the Word that's preached, then there's, a, there's kind of a comfort vacuum that's filled, Paul says, with one of two things. So if we don't have the, if we don't have the teaching that Christ is here in the Word, then you will either, either have one of two things. You'll have the worship of ascent or the worship of descent. In other words, who will ascend into heaven to bring Christ down, or who will go down to the pit to bring him up from the dead? Now, that, that second one is a little more tricky. In other words, who in the Christian church would say that Christ is still dead? But this is precisely the criticism that the Lutherans had for the Catholic Church. In other words, if Jesus is not the Savior who has done everything to save us, if he is not the one who is rescuing us with his, uh, with his blood and redeeming us with his resurrection, if he's not the one doing it, then, then, and we have to add to it with our own works or our own efforts, then it's as if Christ never was raised. Uh, if justification is a matter of, of our works and not Christ's work, then you have the, you have the worship of dissent, the worship of despair, which, which, which is the worship of works. But then there's this worship of ascent. Who will ascend to heaven? And I think most of American Christianity is marked by this kind of worship. It's the worship of mysticism that will clamor up into God's presence. There's this weird sort of thing with uh, the Reformed doctrine that says, that Jesus cannot come down to us according to his body. But on the other hand, we can ascend up and have fellowship and union with him. 
Uh, and this worship of ascent, this worship of mysticism, is what f- tries to fill the void of comfort when you don't have the sacraments and the efficacious word. So, so Paul says, look, if you don't have this clear that Christ is near to you in the preaching of the word, then you're going to be inventing new ways to comfort yourself, but they are false ways to comfort yourself. Then, immediately following these verses, and I'm looking at verses 11 and 12, Paul pulls out two Old Testament quotations, one from Isaiah 28, 16, the other one from Joel 3, 5, to drive his point home. Talk about that, if you would. Yeah, so this is verse 11. Scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. That is a beautiful text. I mean, just like Jesus, uh, 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 just like Adam and Eve were were covered by the 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 lamb, the the sacrifice, so to cover the shame of their nakedness. And just like Jesus says, the church in Laodicea, I will I will cover the shame of your nakedness. That Jesus comes and he and he wraps us in the robe of his righteousness, so that there is no shame for us. I mean, we know that. I mean, this is this great comfort that <laughs> that not only does the Lord love us, but that He in fact likes us. <laughs> he de- He delights in us. Uh, that, so that's there in verse 11. And then verse 12, there's no distinction between Jew and Greek, back to this argument that Paul's fighting against. For the same Lord is the Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call upon him, for everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. You do not have to be first Jewish before you become a Christian. You don't have to be circumcised before you're baptized. You don't have to keep the Sabbath law before you're justified. But Paul says, no, none of these sorts of things. God is the Lord of all, and all that all that is... Um, uh, all that's needed for the Lord's gift is is no works at all, only only faith in His promise. That's it. Now, to the person who still is finding it difficult, and many many do, not only kind of American evangelicals, but uh, all across denominational lines, finding it difficult to comprehend of this in the Pauline terms. That is, in the way that Paul uh, lays it out as stark gift. Uh, sheer grace. They say to you, Brian, uh, I know what you're talking about, and I know that God's salvation is free, but I still have to reach out and grab it, don't I? I, There's something I still have to do. He left the gift on the table. Don't I have to open it? Um, All these analogies kind of begin to multiply. How do you respond? I I know. This is the law trying to sneak in. The law is like the ants in my garage, you know? I mean, you can't keep them out. We we just we want our will to somehow be in there, but the, it's the the fact that we are born in sin. I mean, to, to be an original sinner means that we do not fear, love, or trust in God. It's 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 maybe this simple. The definition of an unbeliever is that they do not believe in Jesus. <laughs> they, I mean, it seems so obvious. But why then are we out there to the unbeliever saying, "Well, you just got to believe." And the unbeliever says, I, I, it's, by, it's impossible, by just the definition of the word, I can't believe, because I'm an unbeliever. And this faith comes as a gift. So Paul will unfold it. I mean, it, it, this is, it's kind of a, a series of questions he's going to ask, and it might help just to kind of read through them uh, qu- quickly in verse 14 here, chapter 10, 14. How will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how will they believe of him whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how can they preach unless they've been sent? And then skipping down a couple, he says at last, for faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. So that faith is not an act of your will. It is the gift of God, and it comes through the hearing of the word of God, through the word of Christ. Faith itself is a gift, so that there's no room for boasting at all. Now, I can't boast that I did something to be saved, that I decided something to be saved, that I accepted something to be saved, that I didn't reject something to be saved. There is no boasting at all, because everything comes from the Lord. And, and that is the thing that gives God all of the glory, and it gives us the great comfort. If I'm a believer in Jesus, He's done it, and He does all things well. Pastor Brian Wolf Miller is pastor of Hope Lutheran Church in Aurora, Colorado. He also co-hosts a weekly radio talk show called Table Talk Radio. Brian, thank you very much. You got it, Todd. The Issues Etc. Book of the Month for October is a novel. We've never done a novel before, but this is the first time. And by all reviews, this is a page-turner. It's written by Issues Etc. regular guest Katie Schuerman, and the novel is called House of Living Stones, a story of forgiveness in the life of a pastor and his congregation. And I just heard from someone this morning who was in the midst of reading it saying, it's a must 
read. It's called House of Living Stones by Katie Shurman, and it comes from Concordia Publishing House. You can browse before you buy at our website, issuesetc.org, issuesetc.org. Look for House of Living Stones, or call Concordia Publishing House right now and order House of Living Stones by Katie Shurman. Their toll-free number, 1-800-325-3040, 1-800-325-3040. When we come back, it's Hour 2 of Issues, etc. on this Friday afternoon. We'll do Part 5 of our series on the small called Articles in the Lutheran Confessions with Pastor Paul McCain talking about sin, the law, and repentance. Listen weekday afternoons to Pastor Todd Wilkin and guests on Issues, etc. Issues, etc. is a listener-supported program. Your financial support is vital for the continuation and expansion of this worldwide outreach. Our mailing address, Lutheran Public Radio, P.O. Box 912, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234. Box 912, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234. You can also donate at our website, issuesetc.org. Issues Etc. is a production of LPR, Lutheran Public Radio.